Espionage is depicted in the movies as being an exciting career full of mystery and intrigue. But in reality, it's a life that is fraught with danger and uncertainty, which may cause an agent to never return home. Nassim Ataya was one of six brothers who lived an impoverished life in Jerusalem during the War of Independence in 1947. After 30 years of rule in Palestine, British forces were on the verge of pulling out of the war, leaving Jewish and Arab forces in a battle to decide the future of the country. Since the Jewish forces had very little information on what the Arab forces may plan to do, their only option was to use espionage to gain insight into what was to come. In order to gain intelligence, they made use of the Arab section, a small subversive group which formed part of the Jewish military, made up of individuals who'd been living on the Arab side but who had decided to leave due to an increase in religious and nationalistic aggression. The members of this group would be fluent in the Arab language and very well acquainted with the culture, and could therefore move more easily through the areas that they were interested in without coming across as suspicious. They would disguise themselves as barbers and peddlers of goods with made-up backstories and, once they'd acquired bits of information, would return to report on anything that they had found. Then on the 22nd of December, 1947, a group of Arab fighters attacked a Jewish convoy which resulted in plans for a raid to be executed in retaliation. Nassim, then 19 years old, was ordered to infiltrate once again, with his mission being to find a path that could be used for the attack and report back by the end of the day. And so Nassim disguised himself as a barber, complete with a set of barber's tools, and he headed out of Jerusalem with a friend who was to drop him off between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Everything up to this point went to plan, and he exited the car, heading in the direction of a town not too far from their location but Nassim was never seen again. It's believed that his cover was blown and that he was taken to an orchard where he was executed. However, this is only speculation as his true fate has never been discovered. Dmitry Polyakov will forever be considered one of the foremost sources of Soviet military intelligence for the US, and at the time, he was America's most important spy. The information that he would bring into the country would eventually aid in the US's strategy in China while the Cold War raged and he was able to provide the US with details on Soviet-era weapons, enabling them to plan and strategize accordingly. He's also cited as being the man responsible for keeping the Cold War from boiling over by providing the US with details of the Soviets' priorities. Born in the Ukraine in 1921, Polyakov served his country during the Second World War. Thereafter, he was inducted into the USSR's GRU, which provided intelligence to the military. He was a man that seemed very down to earth, turning his hand at carpentry in his free time. As his time in the GRU continued, he gained promotions due to his natural abilities and at some point, he decided to turn against the USSR, having become disillusioned by the corruption that had become evident from Soviet leaders in Moscow. The GRU had been working diligently to gain as much intelligence on America as possible, employing agents around the globe to supply information on life in the US. Polyakov was stationed in New York at the time, working from the Soviet mission to the United States. He approached the CIA and offered them his services which they gladly accepted, believing that his impulse to aid the US came from witnessing similar horrors while serving in World War II. Upon his insistence, he was paid a modest amount of $3,000 per year for his services, never accepting cash, but instead opting to be paid with fishing gear, power tools, and firearms. He would provide the US with massive amounts of information that was passed along via radio transmissions, fake rocks, and a hidden chamber in a fishing rod, at one point exposing a British spy, Frank Bozzard, who'd been providing the Soviets with military secrets. Then, in 1984, a Russian magazine ran a piece that included a recipe for a dish made from a small Eastern European bird called a coot. This sent alarm bells ringing among US spies as it was understood that this recipe would be published if Polyakov was in danger. This did indeed turn out to be the case as Polyakov disappeared very shortly after. Some speculated that he'd been caught and executed, while others thought that he had decided to retire. But in 1990, a communist newspaper claimed that he had indeed met his end. Pierre Bart was a Soviet KGB spy who worked in Western Europe. Strangely, he was able to obtain a Finnish passport from a Finnish embassy despite ever having visited the country. 
Before we keep going with the video, I wanted to show you guys a great new mobile game called June's Journey. If you're into true crime and mysteries as much as I am, this game will be perfect for you. June's Journey is a hidden object game, but with a pretty captivating story involving a murder mystery. It takes place back in the 1920s, and each new scene and level takes you through a different chapter of the story, setting up June Parker, the main character, to solve the mysterious murder of her sister. This game is completely free to download, and the basic idea of the game is hunting for clues and hidden objects that may help bring June one step closer to solving the case. You can customize and remodel your mansion as well as your garden island along the way. Now, I grew up playing seek and find games like this, so this game is right up my alley, and I feel like you guys will enjoy it as well. It's super relaxing to play and easy to pick up when you have a few free minutes here or there throughout the day. You can click the link below in the description to download the game on iOS and Android devices, but it's also available on PC through Facebook games. So if you're ready to dive headfirst into a captivating murder mystery and help June solve the mysterious case surrounding her sister, just click the link below to download June's Journey. This was done by the KGB who would counterfeit Finnish citizenships with the help of a priest from a Finnish Orthodox church. In 1966, he moved to Helsinki where he worked in an unassuming bookshop, also holding down various other menial jobs while providing intelligence to the KGB. He would go on to marry a Finnish woman in 1968, who was eventually also suspected of being a spy for the Soviets. In 1979, he moved to Austria, living in Vienna, where he started to work for the Paris-based United Nations. Here, he would have meetings with a fellow spy by the name of Felix, while unbeknownst to the two men, under heavy surveillance from the United States. Then on June the 22nd, wiretappers from the FBI would intercept a call between the two men, made from Pierre Bart to Felix in Washington. It was believed to be a cleverly disguised warning from Bart, informing Felix that he discovered the fact that they were being watched. Bart told Felix that he was feeling unwell and they hoped his friend would not catch the same illness. Felix asked whether his condition was serious, to which Bart replied that it was not. Felix wished him all the best and the phone call ended there. On the 11th of June, Bart left Vienna and simply disappeared forever. In 2010, 54-year-old Christopher Metzos was one of 11 people to be arrested in Cyprus under suspicion that he was part of a deep cover spy ring, and specifically that he was responsible for providing funding to Russian spies who were operating in the United States. Metzos was living in a hotel in Larnaca at the time, from which he was believed to be involved in recruiting Russian intelligence agents. As he was about to board a plane headed to Budapest in Hungary, he was arrested after a red notice was served on him by Interpol and he was charged with acting as an agent of a foreign country and conspiracy to commit money laundering. If found guilty, he would be extradited to the United States. Metzos' arrest, along with the 10 other individuals, caused tensions between the United States and Russia, as Russian Prime Minister Vladimir Putin felt that the American police had gone too far, especially since Russia and the United States had been working on strengthening their relationship prior to the arrests being made. The Russian Foreign Ministry expressed its dissatisfaction over a statement being released by the US Department of Justice concerning the 11 individuals who'd been detained stating that similar incidents had happened in the past when relations between the two countries were improving. After appealing in court, Metzos was released on $33,000 bail, with further proceedings still pending. He took the opportunity he'd been given, and he quickly disappeared. The lawyer who represented Metzos in court stated that he was supposed to have a meeting with Metzos after his court appearance, but he didn't show up. He said that they'd lost all contact with him and he had no idea where he may have fled to. Cyprus police launched a manhunt in search for Metzos, focusing on exit points from Cyprus and entry points into foreign countries. United States officials later declared their dissatisfaction with the Cyprus government, stating that they'd feared that he would flee if he was granted bail unnecessarily. He remains missing to this day. In 2007, CIA agent Robert Levinson was on a mission in Iran, where the US says he was working as a private investigator in an unauthorized capacity. While working in Kish, Levinson met a man who was an American fugitive named Salahuddin. Salahuddin claimed that Levinson told him that he was investigating a cigarette smuggling operation in the Gulf, and that shortly after they'd met, both men were apprehended by security forces. In August of the same year, it was reported that Levinson's wife, Christine, was planning to travel to Iran with their oldest son, Dan, in order to find information on Robert's whereabouts. 
but they were warned against this by the United States Department of State, citing a travel warning to Iran and that if they were to go ahead, they would be doing so entirely at their own risk. Shrugging off the warning, they did go through with their plan and met with Iranian officials and visited a hotel where Levinson had been staying. They were allowed to inspect the flight manifests from all flights traveling from the area at the time he went missing, but they were unable to find any relevant information regarding his whereabouts. They were told by police that they would be sent an investigative report into Levinson's disappearance, but this never came to fruition. Both Christine and Dan have since stated that they were planning to return to the country again to continue their search. In 2011, Levinson's family received photographs showing him in an orange jumpsuit holding up a sign that read, Fourth Year, You Can't or You Don't Want. Help me. Why can you not help me? This is the result of 30 years serving for USA. I am here in Guantanamo. Do you know where it is? Hillary Clinton, who was at the time the United States Secretary of State, said that she thought that Levinson was being held captive somewhere in Southwest Asia. In a CBS interview in September of 2012, the then Iranian president denied allegations that Levinson was being held captive in Iran, but implied that talks over an American-Iranian prisoner exchange had been held, though he failed to follow up on the discussion's results. John Miller from CBS stated that this was seen as an admission that he was in their custody, and the fact that there had been talks over a prisoner exchange was seen as a big step. Christine Levinson appeared before a U.S. Congressional Committee in 2019, where she stated that she felt Levinson had been forgotten and left behind by the U.S. administrators after the fact. In March of 2020, the United States government, along with Levinson's family, declared that they'd concluded Robert had very likely died in Iran at least a year before, and in October, the Iranian government was ordered to pay a sum of $1.4 billion in damages to Levinson's family. In the Milky Way, we too often assume that planets can be studied to prove that there's some level of consistency present. For example, the minerals and weather conditions of most planets we've watched seem to remain relatively the same. While we sometimes discover new details about the said planet, they can still be attributed to information we already knew. That isn't the case with Saturn, though. Saturn is the sixth known planet from the Sun and the second largest in our solar system. We've consistently been studying Saturn for many years now and have uncovered a plethora of new information pertaining to the ringed planet and its many moons. Still, experts have stated that each time Earth takes a closer look at Saturn, something new is discovered. It's not just that the details are being unveiled. Instead, it seems that new facts completely oppose what we already knew. A few facts you may already know about Saturn is that it is a gas giant like Jupiter. Its famous rings stretch outward for thousands of miles and are made up of gas and ice. The ice chunks present in the rings range in size from a speck of dust to a large house. It has a solid core that seems to be covered in liquid gas. It has 62 moons surrounding it, although those moons weren't all discovered at the same time. It's obvious that Saturn has much more information to offer us that we haven't already found. However, it's difficult to work on solving the many mysteries of Saturn when it's been proven that we don't fully understand the few things that we do already know about it. The best example of this predicament comes from newly analyzed behavior of the rings. The rings are caused by the gravity of Saturn's moons, pulling gas and particles from the cloudy planet. Not long ago, it was found that the rings moved outward in a rippling motion. Apparently, they're also pulled inward in a similar motion, though. Scientists have not yet been able to determine what force within the planet is causing the pull. The first assumption would be that the core is responsible, but even if that were the truth, experts will still have to give the core we thought we understood a closer look. Thankfully, science progresses every day, and within just a few years, many of these questions will likely be answered. The topic of dark matter is vague and very confusing. Therefore, it's considered one of science's most perplexing concepts. You've probably heard of dark matter in TV shows, movies, and books. It's commonly used in fictional plots because it's so hard to argue whether or not it works in that way, considering we know so little. Perhaps you're one of the few that have taken the time to study dark matter, but unfortunately, it doesn't really matter where you land on the knowledge of the substance because as of this time, there's no surefire way to confirm or dismiss the facts and ideas that have been produced. To simply put it, it's believed that everything in our universe, from the smallest asteroids to the biggest planets, across every galaxy, only make up 5% of the entire universe, which can make the average person feel pretty small in the grand scheme of things. 
As for the remaining matter, scientists have found that everything seems to be held together by a massive force or object in the center of it all, which takes up about 25%. Studies have proven that the universe is slowly expanding non-stop. However, it's also confirmed that 5% seems to abide by the gravitational pull of whatever dark matter is. A common description of how dark matter works is the spider web theory. Experts speculate that dark matter works like a vast spider web that holds everything together so the entire shift of the universe happens equally throughout it. As you'd expect, the spider web isn't just to the left or the right. It stretches in all directions and holds infinite objects in their designated planes. If this theory is true, it could contribute to issues we've been looking into into space. The view is possibly distorted by the angles of the web and causes planets and stars from other systems to appear as though they're broken, bent, or dead. So although dark matter is real, we can't say for sure exactly what it's composed of or how it works, making it a confusing and often misunderstood concept. It's also important to note that if regular matter takes up about 5% of the universe and dark matter takes up about 25%, what's contained in the other 70%? Sound travels through atoms and molecules using vibration. Space is described as a vacuum, meaning that it should be silent, especially in the vast empty stretches between galaxies. This has been a known fact for decades, but as it turns out, it might not be true. This anomaly is referred to as the space stream or the roar. Studies from recent years were able to detect a low rumbling sound that emits through space almost constantly. The noise isn't an average sound like we're used to though, it's actually caused by radio waves emitting from the source. You should be familiar with the concept of radio waves as they're common in our day-to-day -day lives. Radio waves make our cell phones and radio signals work, so it's assumed that these waves are being produced by a distant planet where the waves are used as well, but that can't be confirmed. The scream has been picked up in countless transmissions where experts were trying to detect signals from closer locations. Unfortunately, this seemingly random roar makes it extremely difficult to pick up anything else in the universe. Research on the sound has been conducted but provided little to no valuable information. A variety of experts have formulated countless theories, including that the sound may be caused by gases swirling around in our galaxy. Another example of a common theory is that the waves come from leftover radiation of dead stars. Sadly, our technology isn't advanced enough yet for us to point out the source of the screen or even the general area it may be coming from. For now, this mystery is still unsolved and continues to stand as a complicated obstacle for scientists trying to explore the universe around us. Perhaps someday there will be a break in the case and the roar will be better understood. It's very likely that this discovery might not happen during our lifetime, so sadly we have to live with the baffling and somewhat creepy presence of the scream heard throughout the stars. While we have a massively better understanding of our solar system than we did centuries or even decades ago, many mysteries remain. The sun is a star necessary for survival on our planet, and we seem to understand how the sun benefits us or harms us, but there's still so much to learn. The Parker Solar Probe was a project intended to take a closer look at our lucky star. It included a massive team of experts and some of the most advanced technologies of its time. The probe was able to get us just a bit closer to the sun and its behavior to confirm many theories and facts we already knew. It also brought attention to a few strange occurrences that we were completely clueless about. For example, the sun is occasionally hit by a strong series of magnetic waves. These waves would have been harmless until it was also revealed that their impact caused the sun's own magnetic field to reverse in action. This brought up a new series of questions and concerns about the sun. If a large enough disturbance occurs, Earth could experience symptoms of the hit, which could affect our everyday lives in ways you couldn't even imagine. We've always known that the Sun experienced powerful waves and solar storms within its atmosphere. However, we were apparently wrong about their strength and speed. It turns out these storms tear across the planet 20 times faster than we originally assumed. These new details are concerning, to say the least, but luckily they can be further studied to increase our understanding of our big yellow circle in the sky that keeps us all alive. The only truly upsetting factor in this case is that stumbling across these new details suggests that there's an endless series of facts we still don't know about the sun. Similarly, it serves as the perfect example of how new facts can completely oppose what we already knew. This requires the attention be returned to some closed studies just to ensure nothing has been missed. 
for the most part, everyone on this planet would benefit from experts uncovering as much knowledge as possible about the sun, considering how vital it is in our survival. Even if certain aspects don't pose an immediate threat, we would all sleep better at night knowing that the sun hopefully won't explode the following morning, because as of right now, we don't understand when or even how something could go catastrophically wrong. Not everyone is concerned with what the rest of the universe holds. Some of us are just curious to know where we came from and how we progressed as a species. However, there may be a connection between other life in the universe and ancient life here on Earth. Over the centuries, we've uncovered and collected a significant amount of information and have made general theories of how life on Earth has always been. Of course, new discoveries are being stumbled upon every day, and many of them dispute the accepted truths of life on Earth. The most unsettling of these theories includes alien life forms and apparent spaceship materials that have been found in the Canadian Rockies. The findings are described as alien-like creatures that don't resemble any of the species that we've previously found and established. The first assumption is that these mysterious creatures were ocean-dwelling and lived long before any of our previously discovered species. A closer look into their biology, however, opposed that theory because there wasn't even a slight resemblance in the ocean life that we've studied. Even if these creatures existed prior to the aforementioned ocean life, they would still show similarities with later beings that adapted from these first drafts. So, the new speculation is that the animals are foreign to our planet. It's believed that they either tried to live here and were unable to adapt after landing, or dropped into the atmosphere after being left behind by more advanced aliens. As research continues in this location, more information is becoming available. Perhaps there will be answers in the coming decades. For now though, the truth behind these beings and their role in our planet, or another planet, is a mystery that bewilders scientists, anthropologists, and average people alike. In 2017, the YouTube channel Apex TV uploaded a video that would go viral within a matter of days. The channel mainly focused on urban legends and the unexplained and paranormal until 2017, when they uploaded their first video with a man only known as Noah. Noah, whose identity has been concealed, claims to be a time traveler from the year 2030, but is currently stuck in the year 2017. The comment section of this now private video lit up with conspiracy theorists and scientists alike trying to get to the bottom of it. Lots of people commented on how this was fake and staged in order to get the channel more views, while others wholeheartedly believed Noah and his claims. To dispel the rumors, Noah took a lie detector test which he passed, proving that he was not some wild science fiction fantasist. He explained, my natural time is the year 2030. That's the year all of my family and friends are in. Simply put, I was fired from my job during a mission in the year 2017, which is why I'm now stuck here. You're probably wondering, if this is all true, how did Noah time travel? Well, he told the Sun newspaper in 2019, I have a device in my left hand. It was implanted before I went back in time via a surgical procedure. It was painless and the device actually helps in transporting all the atoms within my body. I'm not a scientist, so I do not know the details. He also produced an x-ray that shows a small device in his hand. Noah also made a few predictions on what we can expect to happen in the year 2021. He claims that everyone will be wearing Google glasses, self-driving cars will be the next big thing, renewable energy will finally start to take over from fossil fuels, and that Donald Trump will be re-elected for a second term in office. With 2021 just months away, all we can do is wait and see if Noah's predictions come true. Noah also claims to have been to the year 6000. He showed the photo in the video and explained that it had bad quality due to time travel distorting images. He said about the year 6000, artificial intelligence will be able to predict things with 100% accuracy, and in the year 6000, we will upload our brains to computers so that we can live forever. They don't want me to tell you this. According to Noah, there is a version of himself living in our world right now. His natural age in his time is 50, but when he was recruited, he was given an age-reversing drug in order to make him appear 25. Many have asked why Noah hasn't met the version of himself in our world. To prove his claims, his reply was, I have to stay far away from him to avoid causing a paradox, because the results of that could be profound, by what I understand. If Noah is telling the truth, then time travel could be just upon our horizon. Internet forums and discussion boards can often be filled with odd and bizarre people making even more bizarre claims, 
and this story is no exception. In the year 2000, a man by the username Time Travel Zero and John Titor began posting to the Time Travel Institute forum. John claimed that he was a soldier from the year 2036. His mission was to travel back to 1975 in order to get an IBM 5100 computer. This computer was paramount in stopping a computer virus that had obliterated the world. His post reads, Greetings, I'm a time traveler from the year 2036. I'm on my way home after getting an IBM 5100 computer system from the year 1975. My time machine is a stationary mass, temporal displacement unit manufactured by General Electric. The unit is powered by two top-spin dual-positive singularities that produce a standard, offset triple sinusoid. I will be happy to post pictures of the unit. John Tidor became somewhat of an internet celebrity, and he began posting on the Coast to Coast AM forums, specifically addressing the host, Art Bell. For those who aren't familiar, Coast to Coast AM is a radio show that covers topics such as UFOs and the unexplained. During his time on the internet, Tidor made some predictions. He claimed that a civil war would engulf the United States starting in 2004, following the election of the president of that year. He said, the conflict will see a Waco-type event happening every month that steadily gets worse and erupts by 2008. He also made claims about World War III that it would happen in 2015, stating, in 2015, Russia launches a nuclear strike against major cities in the US, China, and Europe. The United States counterattacks. The US cities are destroyed along with the American Federal Empire. The European Union and China were also destroyed. Of course, we're now living in 2020 and none of these things actually happened, but to those living in the early 2000s, these predictions must have played on their minds. Perhaps these predictions did come true, but in an alternate universe than the one John Tidor slipped into to take a break from his mission. Or perhaps these events will come true in the years to come. John made his last forum post in November of 2001 before signing off forever. However, there's a 2005 interview with a man claiming to be John. He told Hustler in February of 2005, If you want to survive the coming conflict, learn to let fear keep you alive. Too many of you turn off the life-saving natural instincts and premonitions when it's convenient. The same person who has five deadbolt locks on their door will think nothing about getting into a parking garage elevator with a total stranger. If you want to live, keep your eyes open. July of 1954 was a hot one for the residents of Tokyo, Japan, with temperatures reaching 23 Celsius and 80% humidity. People were desperately seeking shade and somewhere cool to sit. For employees of the Haneda Tokyo International Airport, it was said to be a day like any other. They were to welcome passengers from their flights from around the world, perform security checks, and let them be on their way to their destination. But one passenger caught their eye and would span a decades-long mystery. When going through customs, a Caucasian man with a beard handed over his passport to be stamped so that he could gain entry into Japan. The passport was different, however, and employees quickly picked up on the fact that instead of his passport saying US or Great Britain, it had the name Tarad on it. According to the employees at the airport, the man spoke mainly French, but could also speak Japanese and several other languages. Not too uncommon for a businessman flying around the world for meetings. The man was quickly whisked away for further interrogation, as no one had ever heard of the country Tarad. In the interrogation room, the man explained that he'd been to Japan before, and even showed them the stamp on his passport from the last time he had visited. He confirmed the company he was working for, and which hotel he had a reservation for, but when they checked, no reservation had been made at the hotel under that man's name. After much back and forth, the employees asked him to point to Tarad on the map. The man pointed to the country of Andorra, nestled between France and Spain. He was perplexed as to why the country was labeled Andorra and insisted that Tarad had existed for thousands of years. Suspicions about this man and his intentions were growing, and so the employees contacted the local police, who detained him in a room pending a further investigation. They believed that the man was involved in illegal activities such as drug smuggling or weapons dealing and was therefore using face documentation to gain entrance into the country. Tokyo police worked through the night to find the true identity of this international man of mystery. Two guards had been posted outside of the man's hotel room in case he tried to make a quick escape. But the night passed without incident. 
When officers went to retrieve the man for further questioning the next day, he was gone. Despite there being only one way in and out of the hotel room, the man had disappeared as mysteriously as he had appeared. Over the years, many people have tried their best to explain what happened on that hot July day at Tokyo International Airport. The prevailing theory is that the man is a time traveler, and somehow, during his flight, he slipped into our dimension. With little answers, we're left wondering, who was this man from Tarad? Friends Anne Moberly and Eleanor Jourdain made the trip from their home in Great Britain to Versailles, France, on August 10, 1901. What started as a sightseeing holiday for the two women became one of the strangest events in history. After the two had gotten themselves settled and cleaned up after their long journey, they took a short tour around the Palace of Versailles. Both women looked at each other and agreed the whole thing was far too boring for them, so they decided to leave the group. They headed for the gardens of the palace and happened upon a small house on the palace's grounds that was built in 1762. Using only their guidebooks and intuition, the women tried to find a way into the manor house, but ended up getting lost. Instead of sticking to the main streets and paths, the women ended up going down a small alleyway, which led them to what happened next. Both women described their surroundings changing rapidly before their eyes. Instead of houses, they saw dilapidated farmhouses and felt a sense of unease and dread. People around them were dressed in period clothing that stood out as being odd and unhuman. Anne said everything suddenly looked unnatural, therefore unpleasant. Even the tree seemed to become flat and lifeless, like woodworked and tapestry. There were no effects of light and no shade and no wind stirred the trees. After much wandering around, looking at dated cottages and people who looked like wax sculptures, the two women reached a pair of gates. However, their strange time slip wasn't over. Eleanor claimed she had seen Marie Antoinette sat in the garden sketching and painting. As soon as the two women returned to the cottage, everything returned back to normal, and they rejoined their tour group. Tourists began to appear wearing clothing of the time period, and the events of the day slowly went back to normal. Both women were adamant that the home that they found was haunted and that they went down the alley and somehow slipped through time into August of 1792. The pair have stood by their stories despite receiving a lot of criticism from skeptics. In 1951, RAF Air Marshal Sir Robert Victor Goddard wrote a piece for the Saturday Evening Post newspaper, claiming that in 1935, he'd been involved in a time slip. Victor, born in Wembley, London, served in the First World War and the Second World War, with a long list of battles and accomplishments to his name. But it's the 1951 article that would broadcast his name into the limelight. The story goes that Victor claims that in 1935, he was flying his Hawker Hart light bomber over an abandoned airfield when he got caught up in a storm. Victor claims that as he was flying through, he somehow slipped into the year 1939. He explained that he saw brand new yellow airplanes which were not in use by the RAF at the time and that he saw people in the airfield wearing blue overalls and not the standard issue brown overalls. All of the buildings in the airfield were no longer abandoned and had been redone with aircraft hangars and living quarters standing much nicer than they'd previously done. Just four years later, the abandoned Air Force base would be reopened and transformed into a training center, preparing the country once more for war. The airfield was filled with yellow hawker hearts, just as Victor had seen on that night in 1935. Did Victor slip four years into the future and see the newly refurbished RAF base? Or are these false claims? Victor would spend the rest of his career defending his story about the night and begin giving talks on UFOs and other paranormal phenomena. The missing 411 phenomenon is a term coined by author and supernatural investigator David Paulides. Paulides has released various books and documentaries about the subject. He tackles the growing number of people who are going missing from U.S. national parks and forests and claims to find out the true answer. He claims that he was approached by a park ranger while in a national park. The park ranger was familiar with his previous work surrounding Bigfoot and begged Paulides to investigate. The park ranger explained how as far back as the 1800s, people have been going missing in the U.S. national parks under very mysterious circumstances. The National Park Service that was established in 1916 has estimated that over 1,000 people have disappeared in national forests and parks. 
With police and government resources being stretched tighter every year, it can be easy to see why so many people go missing. Others have put forward the argument that police forces and search and rescue teams should be better equipped by now to deal with such incidents, as they've been happening for decades. In his book titled Missing 411 that took four years and 9,000 hours of investigation, David examines case files of missing people in a way that has never been done before. He looks at traits, geographic location, and other things to draw conclusions. Although he doesn't have one prevailing theory as to what's happening in our national forests, he wrote in the book stating, The field of suspects is narrowing. Go out of your comfort zone to determine who or what is the culprit. David has often alluded to the fact that the missing 411 phenomenon is closely linked to the paranormal and may well be not of this world. Is there a mysterious paranormal force luring people from the U.S. national parks? Perhaps Bigfoot is to blame. Or is there a simpler, evidence-backed explanation? On February 21st, 1997, Art Bell, the host of Coast to Coast AM, received an odd call from a man going by the name of Mel Waters. Coast to Coast AM is no stranger to odd callers and wild claims, as the radio show deals mainly with the paranormal and unexplained. However, something about Mel Waters bothered listeners tuning into the show that day. Mel claimed that there was a bottomless pit located just outside of his home in Katitas County, Washington. He claims to have performed an experiment where he dropped a weighted fishing line into the pit after he noticed that anything he threw into it didn't hit the bottom. Mel claims that he got as far as 80,000 feet and the weighted line still hadn't hit the ground. Many people have called this an obvious hoax, much like the Area 51 call that Art Bell received, but paranormal investigators believe Mel and have been searching for the hole ever since. It is claimed that the pit possesses paranormal powers. A neighbor of Waters disposed of their dog's body in it, only to find their dog alive and well days later walking around the property. He also claims that he tried to use his radio while at the pit, However, instead of unusual music and radio shows, Mel was met with old radio stations with weird voices emanating from his radio. The story then goes that Walters was approached by a man in a biohazard suit who told him that the pit area had to be sealed off due to a plane crash. From then on, no one was allowed to get close to the pit. The government stole the land from Waters and gave him money in order to move away from the property. Paranormal investigators have spent years trying to figure out the exact location of what has now become known as Mel's Hole. The more paranoid investigators believe that the government is involved and are covering up whatever is in the hole. The story of Mel's Hole is considered a paranormal, urban legend. People have spent tireless hours debunking Mel's Hole story, but there are still some people out there that wholeheartedly believe that Mel's Hole is real and it's only a matter of time before we find it. The case of Shanti Deva is one of the most compelling cases of reincarnation we have to date. Shanti was born in 1929 and didn't speak much as she was a child but grew up to have a pretty normal childhood. That was until the age of four when she burst out, this is not my real home, I have a husband and a son in Mathura, I must return to them. Shanti's parents brushed it off as their little girl having a very active imagination and reassured her that this was indeed her home. Nonetheless, Shanti persisted, telling everyone, including teachers at her school, that she was a woman named Lugdi Devi and lived in Mathura. She even gave the teachers Lugdi's address and they sent a letter to the house with Lugdi's husband, Kedar Nath, writing back to them. Kedar confirmed that his wife had died during childbirth about 14 months before Shanti had been born. Awestruck, he visited Shanti where she was able to recall details about Lugdi's life. She was able to tell him where their home was and what it looked like inside and even gave details about her extended family. Gandhi was fascinated by Shanti's case and paid her a visit. It was concluded that Shanti was telling the truth. No one had told her any details about Lugdi Devi and she was able to recall memories with complete accuracy. The whole of India rejoiced as they had their first genuine reincarnation. Lugdi was a devout follower of Lord Krishna and many believe that her devotion to Krishna is the reason that she was reincarnated. Shanti Devi said, I'd almost reached the state of internal bliss and salvation, but I made a mistake. I was far too eager to come back to earth again, 
longing to see my son and yearning for my husband. My love was egotistical, greedy, and demanding. I still loved myself even when I was dead. Therefore, I had to experience death's next stage, reincarnation. My earlier life is still with me and had never really come to an end. It was my real life. The other was like a dream. Hoya Bachu, located in Romania, has a reputation as the world's creepiest forest and has been called the Bermuda Triangle of Romania. It has attracted scientists and witches alike, desperately trying to find the secrets that lay within. The forest is named after a shepherd who went missing along with his flock of 200 sheep. He was last seen walking through the tall, twisting trees before vanishing forever. Another local legend is of a girl who went missing in the forest, only to reappear after five years in the same clothes, with no idea where she had been. Hoya Bachu is most famously known for the apparent UFO sightings that happened there in 1968. A man by the name of Emil Barnea, who was a military technician, claims to have photographed a UFO in the clearing of the forest. One man by the name of Alex regularly visits the Hoya Bachu forest in hopes of catching a glimpse of some of the paranormal activity that takes place within its trees. One night, Alex took the brave decision to camp overnight and had this to say, me and my friends kept being woken by a very loud hoof noise, like a horse or a particularly large deer. Every time we would stick our heads out of the tent to investigate, the noise would stop. Should you be brave enough to venture into the Hoya Bachu forest, you'll be met with strange symptoms such as nausea, anxiety, and the feeling of being watched, and all of your electronics typically failing. That's not all, you'll possibly encounter ghosts or ectoplasms among other horrors, should you be brave enough to venture into this haunted forest. In Dumberton, northwest of Glasgow, there lies a bridge that has a chilling reputation. Dog walkers have been reporting that since the 1950s, their dogs have been compelled to throw themselves over the bridge to their deaths. It's estimated that over 600 dogs have leapt from the bridge, 50 of which lost their lives. The bizarre phenomena has left locals and paranormal investigators scratching their heads. Lottie McKinnon said, I was sure she was dead. Something overcame Bonnie as soon as we approached the bridge. At first, she froze, but then she became obsessed by a strange energy and ran and jumped off the parapet. Others have described watching their dogs scale the bridge wall before jumping, and others have even claimed that dogs who survived the jump would return for another attempt. Something at Overton Bridge is luring dogs to their deaths, whether that is a ghost or another paranormal entity. There have been numerous scientific explanations put forward. However, the locals of Dumberton aren't convinced. Their local folklore and history is full of superstition and belief in the paranormal. They believe that a ghost called the White Lady of Overton is responsible for the mysterious dog deaths. The White Lady of Overton is the ghost of a widow from 1908 who walks around the bridge and surrounding areas looking for her deceased husband. It's thought that the bridge is a thin place, a pagan Celt belief where the veils between our world and the next are the thinnest. Pakistan International Air Flight 404 is a regular flight from Gilgit to Islamabad in the far east of Pakistan. The flight comes close to the border with India and goes over a particularly dangerous area in the form of the Himalayas. Despite the issues, this usually goes off without a hitch, but on August 25, 1989, something unusual happened. On a relatively clear day at 7.35 a.m., the plane left Gilgit Airport without issue. There were 54 people on board, including the five crew members. About five minutes after takeoff, the pilot made a routine radio call to air traffic control. It was the last time anybody heard anything from anyone on board that plane. When the plane didn't arrive in Islamabad on time, the Pakistani military launched several aerial searches. It was initially believed the plane had crashed somewhere in the Himalayas, although why such a crash would occur remains unknown. Military searches turned up nothing. For years after the incident, civilian and military search teams took to the mountains in an effort to find any evidence about what happened that summer, but there was nothing. While this is the most obvious answer, there are of course a number of conspiracy theories that have arisen. Given how close Islamabad is to Pakistan's border with India, some have suggested that the plane may have flown off course into Indian airspace 
prompting Indian authorities to shoot the plane down. There's little evidence for this though, and the Indian authorities joined efforts to search for the plane, also coming up with nothing. It hasn't been the first time planes have gone missing over mountains and have only been uncovered decades later, such as Air India's 101, which crashed into a mountain in 1966 and wasn't found for 20 years. Hopefully, this means there will be answers in the near future though. At some point between January 29, 1921 and January 31st, the 11-man crew of Carol A. Deering disappeared without a trace. The fate of the crew is one of the most puzzling maritime mysteries and one that will likely never be answered. The Carol A. Deering was a five-masted schooner owned by Gardiner Deering. In August of 1920, the ship left Norfolk, Virginia with an experienced 11-man crew. According to reports, there were no known issues with the ship when it set sail south, heading for Rio de Janeiro, with cargo of coal. The first four days of the trip passed without incident before the captain became mysteriously ill. He couldn't continue and the ship docked in Delaware so both the captain and the first mate, his son, could disembark. The captain was replaced by Captain Willis Warmwell, a retired 66-year-old veteran sea captain while Charles McClellan was recruited to take place of the first mate. The first leg of the journey seemed to have gone on without a hitch and the ship arrived in Brazil to deliver the coal without any problems. In December, the Carol A. Deering left Rio with all 11 men on board and set off back to Virginia. However, not everything aboard was great as while docked in Brazil, Warmwell confessed to another captain that he didn't trust most of his crew. The complaint was repeated again when the Deering docked for supplies in Barbados and Warmwell told Captain Hugh Norton of the Augustus W. Snow that he was having trouble with his crew. McClellan was a particular problem as he constantly was drunk while ashore and treated the crew badly. According to Norton, McClellan got drunk in Barbados and complained that Warmwell's poor eyesight meant McClellan had to do most of the navigation and Warmwell wouldn't let him discipline the crew properly. Norton also overheard McClellan saying he would get Warmwell when they got back to Virginia. On January 29th, the Deering passed by a lightship off North Carolina. The lightship's keeper reported that an unidentified member of the Deering's crew called over with a megaphone that they'd lost both anchors in a storm. He also saw members of the crew milling about on the quarterdeck of the ship, an area the crew wouldn't normally be allowed. Three days later, the Coast Guard spotted the ship again. This time it had run aground on the Diamond Shoals, a group of sandbars considered to be one of the most dangerous spots in the Atlantic seaboard. The ship's sails were still set but there didn't appear to be anyone on board. When the weather finally cleared enough for workers to reach the ship, they found the ship completely abandoned. The crew as well as their personal belongings and navigational equipment were all missing. There was an exhaustive investigation conducted by the FBI, but none of the crew, the missing items, or the ship's logs were ever found. Many put the disappearance down to mutiny, given Warmwell's concerns about his crew, but some believe pirates or even the Bermuda Triangle may have been to blame. In 1966, three young women went for a day out at a crowded beach. After going out for a swim, they were approached by a man on a small boat and climbed aboard. This is the last confirmed sighting of any of the women. On June 2nd, Ann Miller picked up her two friends, Patricia Blow and Renee Brawl, in her car and took them to Indiana Dunes State Park, arriving at about 10 a.m. It was already very busy and many visitors remember seeing the three young women. After about two hours, the women left their belongings on the beach and entered the water in their swimsuits. A young couple who'd been sitting nearby noticed them in the water and saw them talking to a man on a trimaran boat. They didn't pay the women any more attention and continued on their day until they decided to leave as the sun began to set. This was when they noticed the women's things were still lying on the beach where they'd been left and realized they hadn't returned. The items included Anne's car keys, money, and clothes they'd traveled to the beach in. The couple handed the abandoned items to a park ranger so they could be returned when the women came back for them. Two days later, Patricia's father called the ranger station in hopes that they would have information about his missing daughter. None of the girls had returned home from the day at the beach and the families were growing worried. Upon realizing the items belonged to missing people, the authorities were contacted and all three women were reported missing. 
Police searched the south shore of Lake Michigan and the waters itself, but there was no sign of the women or the boat they'd last been seen in. Because the beach was so busy, there were plenty of witness accounts, but they only left more questions than answers. Multiple witnesses backed up the couple, saying the girls had been aboard a small boat, talking to a man in his mid-twenties with tanned skin and dark hair. Unfortunately, the description didn't narrow down the search too much, but the description of the man and the boat matched many visitors to the beach that day. However, other witnesses described seeing the girls aboard a much larger boat. It was determined that the women had likely gotten a lift back to shore aboard the first boat before the man went to get the second, larger boat. Theories about what could have happened included a floating abortion clinic, an accident, or that the women had faked their own disappearance to run away from unhappy marriages. If the women did lose their lives on the boats that day, their bodies may never be found. Nobody realized there was anything unusual about the October 2008 voyage of the Tai Ching 21 until the burned out remains of the fishing vessel were discovered off Kiribati on November 9th. The five-ton Taiwanese vessel was found abandoned by another fishing ship in the area. It was completely gutted by fire, though there was no smoke, indicating the fire had long since burned out. No remains of the 29 crew members were found on board, and the lifeboats and life rafts were all missing, giving hope the crew had managed to escape. While this is probably the case, the crew were never seen again, despite an extensive search and rescue effort involving multiple countries, including the United States and New Zealand. After months of searching the Pacific Ocean around where the ship was found, the search was called off, and to this day, the 29 crew members remain lost at sea. After being found, the ship was towed back to Taiwan for a proper investigation, but the results of the investigation were never made known. It's known that the last communication from the ship came 12 days before it was found. It was a personal call made by the captain to his wife in Taiwan via a satellite phone. He'd also recently made a routine call to the company that owned the ship. All appeared to be fine at the time. There were no emergency calls or mayday signals sent, but it seemed shortly after the call that something aboard caught fire. Whether it was a purposeful sabotage, an accident, or something mechanically wrong with the ship remains unknown. Rather than calling for help, it appears the entire crew boarded the lifeboats and left the ship to burn. An alternative explanation could be that the ship was attacked by pirates. While the South China Sea isn't well known for piracy, it does occur. However, piracy in this area tends to focus on stealing cargoes of liquid fuel and leaving the crew unharmed. After a heist, pirates in the area will often destroy communication devices aboard the ship. It's possible this may have occurred before an unrelated fire, leaving the crew unable to contact anyone for help, though a fishing vessel would have been an unlikely target. Whatever happened, it's odd that no sign of any of the crew has ever been found despite extensive efforts. 25 people were aboard the Joyita when it disappeared in October of 1955. The ship was later found severely damaged. There were bloody bandages on the floor. The 16 crew members and 9 passengers were missing. Unlike other similar cases, there have been multiple reported sightings of the captain in the years following the disappearance, but what exactly happened remains a mystery. The Joyita was an old ship. It was built in 1931, used by the US Navy during World War II, and was now being chartered by Captain Thomas Miller, a British-born man living in Samoa. Miller used the Joyita for fishing and trading. In October of 1955, he planned a two-day journey to the Togolo Islands carrying medical supplies, empty oil drums, oil and food. The plan was to bring cargo to Copra on the way back. An issue with the port engine clutch forced Miller to delay the trip for a day. Instead of resolving the issue, the Joyita left the port with just one working engine though. Along with Miller and the cargo, there were 15 crew members and 9 passengers, which meant there were more people aboard than there were life jackets. The ship left port on October 3rd and was supposed to return on October 5th. When the Joyita failed to return, Sunderlands from the New Zealand Air Force searched 100,000 square miles of the ocean. There was no sign of the ship or its occupants. The Joyita would remain missing for five weeks. It's not clear whether or not it was found in the area that the New Zealand Air Force had already searched, but it was some 600 miles off of its route. Investigators found that a cooling pipe had broken and the ship's lower decks had been flooded. The lifeboats and life jackets were missing, as were the ship's logbooks and Miller's firearm. 
Interestingly, a doctor's bag had been left on deck, along with a scalpel and four lengths of used bandages, and had been taken with the people who fled on the lifeboats. Miller's family don't believe he would have willingly left the ship, but some people at the time suggested Miller was fleeing dead, and some unconfirmed sightings placed him in Singapore, the West Indies, and Honolulu years after the incident. Others have suggested attacks from a Japanese fishing vessel or a Russian submarine were responsible. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the link below to download June's journey and help June solve the mysterious case of her sister.